I'm ready. Well. Okay, I, I'm I'm ready. <laughs> JD. Okay, JD, you are one of the most famous gospel singers in the world. The first question of someone in the, in the theater. As everyone knows, Elvis was a gospel lover. How and when did the two of you really first met? Well, I met Elvis when, I, when he was 14 years old. When he was 14, I was 24. I was 10 years older than Elvis. And as a boy, he came to the gospel scenes that we had in uh, Memphis, Tennessee at the LS Auditorium. And he lived two blocks away in a low-rent government housing project. And he would come to all the gospel scenes. And at that time, I didn't even know his name because he was just a kid. And uh, he would hang around backstage and ask questions. And uh, one month he missed coming to the scene. And by that time, to start with, Elvis was sort of a worry wart to answer all the questions that he wanted because he wasn't Elvis then. He was just a kid. And uh, one month he missed. And I said, son, where were you at last month? He said, well, I didn't have enough money to come. Uh, to buy a ticket so I couldn't come. I said, well, from now on, you don't have to have a ticket. You come to the back door and I'll let you in for nothing. And that's the way we've done it until about the next thing I knew, he would let me in the back door of his concert for nothing. <laughs> as far as I heard, everyone understood. Okay, you missed? Um, op de antwoorden vraag was dat hij Elvis ontmoette toen Elvis nog maar 14 jaar was. JD was op dat moment 24, dus hij was 10 jaar ouder op dat moment. Elvis woonde toen in Memphis op ongeveer twee uh, blokken verder in een soort sociale woning. Uh, JD kende Elvis toen op dat moment niet. Elvis kwam toen wel heel veel backstage en hij kwam altijd luisteren naar de gospel songs die ze zongen. En hij stelde altijd heel veel vragen. Nu op een gegeven moment uh, bleef Elvis een gedurende een hele maand weg en zei die vond het raar en toen Elvis op een dag weer verscheen vroeg hij hem wat er gebeurd was en Elvis antwoordde dat hij geen geld had om een twee tickets te kopen en zei die zei wel jongen vanaf nu is dat licht niet meer nodig uh, je komt maar gewoon aan de deur en ik laat je binnen gaan en dat is zo'n tijd lang doorgegaan dat hij gratis binnen mocht tot op het moment dat Elvis zelf mij binnen liet langs de achterdeur. En résumé pour les, euh, les femmes français, francophones, euh, Jedi a rencontré Elvis quand, il a, quand Elvis avait 14 ans. Euh, Jedi lui-même avait 24 ans alors, ça fait 10 ans de plus. Euh, Elvis, dans ce temps, il vivait... Euh... Ok, la deuxième question est vraiment une question, mais je voulais vous le dire pour vous lire. Il dit, c'est une question, mais je veux vous lire pour vous. Il dit, from someone in Brussels, says, no question, just bravo and many thanks for the, for the pleasure we have from your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then now the next, next question is that, did you meet Elvis regularly in the following months and years? Well, when Elvis became a star, uh, I didn't see him for about four years. Uh, he was so busy. And of course, I had a career in gospel music, and I didn't run across him again for about four years. And one day I was, we travel in the States by a private bus. We have a big bus, uh, like the uh, bus line you used to travel in. And uh, I was driving our bus down in Louisiana, and uh, this brand new Cadillac automobile passed me with a beautiful lady sitting uh, 
on the side that I could see, and the buses are real high, and the car is real low. So I'm looking down at uh, this beautiful lady uh, at her legs and uh, enjoying the beautiful scenery that God had provided. And uh, I would wave at her and throw her a kiss, and she would throw me one back. And then uh, Elvis would, I mean, I didn't know it was Elvis at the time. It was just a man driving the car. He would pass me, and then he'd let me pass him again, and here he'd come again. And this went on for about a hundred miles. And more and more, she would tease me like she was flirting with me. She really wasn't because Elvis was having me to do so. And I would throw her kisses, and uh, she'd show a little bit more of her legs each time. Nothing, nothing bad, but I mean, uh, just to have to make it fun. So we got to the next town, which was oh, about 50 miles. This went on. And the Cadillac pulled in front of the bus and stopped real quick. And I said, well, that's her husband. He's going to whip me. I'm going to have to whip him one. So Elvis jumped out of the car and came to the door of the bus, and he had on sunglasses. I didn't recognize him because four years had gone by. So he stepped up on the bus, and I jumped up ready to have a fight. And, uh, he took his glasses off and said, Hi, Mr. Sumner, I'm Elvis. I said, And I was real relieved to uh, know that I wasn't going to have a fight. But that's the first time I had saw him since he had become a superstar. about songs, it says. Uh, what, you did a lot of songs together with, uh, with Elvis, but what was particularly the, the song you most liked to do with him? Well, that's a pretty hard question to answer because there were so many I liked, but I think it would have to be hearing him sing, uh, of course, How Great Thou Art had to be number one, but uh, Outside of that, it had to be bridge over troubled water. He used to thrill me to death when he was young. Same bridge. Another day from the public was what the evening is. Okay, we are in 1973, and it says, um, I guess that Elvis on tour, 72, of course, and Aloha from Hawaii were pretty big moments for you as well. Could you tell a little bit about the satellite special, how Elvis felt about it, and how you thought about it at that time? Well, of course, on that show that was supposed to have been four billion people to see Elvis on the satellite, uh, Aloha from Hawaii. And Elvis was excited about it because it was the first a worldwide uh, television program that was ever broadcast. And Elvis Presley was the first one to do that. And one of the things I remember that, of course, he took us to Hawaii, he took us and all of our families, and uh, we stayed there for two weeks. It didn't take two weeks in order to make that uh, television program worldwide. But that's the kind of man he was. He took us all over for two weeks, and we enjoyed the Hawaii. And uh, he told me that he made, for that show, he made $4 million for that one show. And, uh, of course, he told me at the same time that the first year that he ever was ever in business, the first year that he started singing, he made $3 million. And he said it got worse every year. So it was a pretty exciting uh, thing to be on uh, the first worldwide television program. Okay. 
next is a remark from the audience. I'd rather, it's written in French, but I have to translate it, of course. It says, I admire your voice, Mr. Sumner. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, also, Presley has been sick a couple of times and didn't look so good. His death came as a total surprise to the public. Were you surprised when you heard the news? Yes, uh, being around somebody all the time, you don't realize a deterioration. Uh, being around a child as they grow up, you don't realize how fast they're growing. Uh, I didn't realize that Elvis was as sick as he was, and I was with him every day. Uh, when I, that was the film, I mean, the, the uh, television special that was Elvis in concert. And they, it was shown after he passed away, and I couldn't believe sitting in my den watching that television show, I couldn't believe how bad and how sick Elvis looked. And when I was there with him when we filmed the show and could not see it because you deteriorate daily and you really can't tell it. But uh, he was swollen up, a very sick man. I sat in my den and uh, it was a very hard thing to watch, uh, knowing that he was that sick, and I wasn't able to even detect it. But I was on one of his planes. We were starting to do the tour that we were supposed to do when he passed away, and I was on his jet star. His jet star was a smaller plane than the Lisa Marie. It was a customized plane also, but it would comfortably seat 18 people. Of course, the Lisa Marie would seat 40 or 50 very comfortably. And uh, but we were on, we were getting on the jet star when Felton Jarvis, who was sort of in charge of the tour, informed me that the tour had been canceled. And I couldn't imagine why we would cancel a tour. It was supposed to have lasted for 14 days. And I questioned him. He said, believe me, J.D., I just talked with the colonel, and the tour is canceled. The first thing I thought was that Vernon, Elvis's daddy, who was very, very ill at the time, I thought that something impossibly happened to him. But I got in my car, that was in Nashville, that's where I lived. I got in my car and started home. And on the way home, they announced on the radio that the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, had died that day at 2 o'clock. Well, just before then, uh, Elvis had given me a limousine, a 26-foot white Lincoln limousine. So I went home and got a hold of my son-in-law, Ed Enoch, who is in the quartet now, and got my bus driver, and we, and my bus driver, drive us over to Memphis. And only until I seen Elvis laying in state did I really believe that Elvis Preston was dead. When I got to Memphis, well, uh, Vernon called me in, Vernon, his daddy, his Aunt at Della had an apartment within Grayson. She was sort of in charge of sort of the head housekeeper for Elvis, keeping the cooking done right in the house cleaning. And he was in her apartment. Uh, his his mother, his grand Elvis's grandmother, Aunt Della, and Vernon was in that apartment. So Vernon sent for me and asked me if I would. Uh, handle Elvis's funeral. He said, you knew what songs that he loved the best, and you knew what minister he would like to have preach the funeral. So if you would, if you would handle the funeral for me, I would appreciate it. I went back to my hotel and called Rex Humbard. Of course, I had the Stamps Quartet to do the biggest part of the singing. I had Kathy Westmoreland to sing. My Heavenly Father watches over me. 
been an old quartet that Elvis used to love when he was a kid called the Statesman Quartet. Jake Hess was sort of Elvis's idol uh, when it came to a lead singer. So I got the Statesman Quartet in and uh, got James Blackwood of the Blackwood Brothers and even had Joe Bercio, who was Elvis's orchestra director. He was at the funeral and uh, we more or less let him just direct how great thou art. He said, I want to do it for him just one more time. But it was a shocking experience to uh, put away the best friend I ever had, and that was Elvis Presley. Okay, we already are at the last question because time is running up and we have to show Flaming Star in a few minutes, otherwise we'll be here at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, the question is long, but maybe the answer is short, maybe. I'd like to, one, to ask you one more thing about, before we close this little interview with questions asked by the fans. The, old, the one thing that most of the fans never seem to forget about Elvis is, is his sense of humor. Can you recall one of the jokes he played on you? Or a funny thing that happened while you were on the road? Only one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the worst, and it's not a short answer, and I wish it was, but it's not a short answer. He didn't do anything short. Uh, we were playing the Hilton Hotel in Las Vegas, and uh, it was my duty, as I stood on this side of the stage over here, to watch the audience. And uh, girls tried to come up on the stage because the stage wasn't very high. And Elvis, uh, the colonel told me, he said, don't let any girls come on the stage. Stop them. But Elvis told me to let the pretty ones get through. <laughs> and. Uh, so it was quite a, quite a chore because he could, he, could, uh, he could use them within his show. But this night, uh, the bodyguards, head of security, told me they were going to, somebody had called and they were going to uh, kill Elvis. They were going to shoot him. And uh, I was supposed to watch the audience and not keep my own Elvis, because my job also was to keep my own Elvis in case he wanted to do something a little different. Charlie Hodge was on the other side, and he was supposed to watch the other side of the audience. Well, for somebody that was going to shoot Elvis, well, it didn't happen during the first show. So between the first and second show, they said for me to bring the stamps up to the Imperial Suite. That was Elvis' suite. Uh, that this guy had called and said he wasn't able to get him on the first show, but he would shoot him on the second show. So he brought us all up to the suite. They had about 30 security guards up there. While they were briefing us on security, the front door, somebody run through the front door and they hollered, there he is, the SOB, there he is. And they started firing guns. Of course, they were blanks, but I didn't know it at that time. And uh, Red West grabbed his back and fell in the floor and started jerking like he was dying. And Elvis hit the floor. And uh, me trying to protect Elvis. I, because there was a lot of gunshots going off in the suite. So I lay on top of Elvis. Why I did, I don't know. I loved Elvis, but not enough to die right at that time. But why I did it, I'll never know. I don't know but one uh, that I would die for, and that's my grandson. But I lay on Elvis and uh, lay my arms out trying to protect him. Well, they kept shooting, and I felt something move underneath me. And it was Elvis laughing. And uh, his stomach was just going up and down. And uh, 
So I got up and I said, okay, boys, it's a joke. The joke's over. And about that time, one of the bodyguards put his arm around or gun around the wall and shot another blank and it hit me on the cheek up here and stung pretty bad. So back down, I went on Elvis again uh, to protect him. But some of you may know the Oak Ridge Quartet at that time, Richard Sturban was singing bass also with the Stamps Quartet. He is now the bass singer with the Oak Ridge. But he was under a table praying, oh God, save us. I mean, uh, he thought he was going to die. But that made me so weak until I couldn't eat for about three days. But that was funny to Elvin, but it wasn't very funny to me. <laughs>